Well, good morning to you. Happy July 5th. Hope you had a, a good holiday yesterday, however you chose to celebrate uh, Fourth of July this year. I know things were uh, a little bit different. I want to begin this morning with some uh, reading some verses from Psalm 33. As I read, the words will be on the screen behind you, and then we'll stand and do our uh, pledges to the flags. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. And may God... May God's mercy show on us, may it show in our church, may it show in our community, and in our nation. Let's stand together. As we say pledges to the flag this morning, we'll pledge first to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and love. My country, tis of the sweet land thank you that we live in the greatest nation in the world. We thank you for this privilege, for the freedoms that we have, for the liberties that we have. And I love this land. But Father, we're in trouble, yeah. and we desperately, desperately need your help. <coughs> Father, we are flawed. We are imperfect. Our eyes are turned to you. And God, I pray, and it has to begin with me, and it has to begin with everybody in this room, and it has to spread from there, Father, that we would make our hearts right with you. And that as a nation, before it's too late, we would turn ourselves back to you. Father, for all the things that are going on in our nation, God, heal us. Please heal us. Help us to, to focus on you. We can't do this without you. So, God, we, we bow before you. And just say, we so desperately need you. And Father, in this hour as we worship together, we thank you for this privilege we have to be here. 
to praise you and to worship you this morning. Father, ultimately, that's what it's all about. Not that we're Americans, but that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you for that citizenship that we have because of you. So be with us in this hour now. Be with Mike in a little bit as he comes and shares your word with us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you that are watching via Facebook, uh, we ask that you would uh, like uh, as you watch this. Uh, put a note in there that you're watching so we know that you're there. We deeply, deeply uh, would appreciate that. Let's continue singing with Who You Say I Am. Thank you. you. may be seated. 
Pastor Mike. Good morning. Let me thank you again for your flexibility during these days and the things that we're having to go through and the things we're having to do. But appreciate you being um, understanding as we try to navigate territory we've never been to before. Well, it's weekend, Independence Day weekend, a day when we celebrate freedom. We celebrate the sovereign independence of our nation, but also our lives together as a free people. We remember how that we, uh, our nation was once uh, a part uh, of the tyranny of King George, but we declared our in independence from that. And we think about all the freedoms that our nation provides for us, and we celebrate those freedoms this weekend because we're a people who value freedom. And we are a people who seek to protect our freedoms at all costs. We're even willing to fight and even die for those freedoms. And we're very careful to protect our freedoms, except in one area. There's one area of life that very few people stop to think about that becomes, I'm convinced, the greatest threat to our freedom. And the greatest threat to our freedom is sin. Whenever I decide I'm going to live my life the way that I want to, the very thing that I think freedom is, living just the way I want to, and yet you do that, live the way you want to, as opposed to the way that God wants you to, that is called sin, and that becomes a problem for all of us. Here's something I want you to see this morning, that being sinners, we are constantly faced with the temptation to sin. We understand the, the ramifications of sin. We understand the, the consequences of sin. Sin separates us from God. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, you have no relationship with God because of sin. Sin has separated you from God. If you are a Christ follower, sin interrupts your fellowship with God. It disrupts that fellowship with God. And it robs you of the power that you need to serve God and to live for God victoriously in this evil world. But there's one other thing about sin, one of the byproducts of sin that a lot of folks don't want to talk about, and it's this, that sin enslaves. Sin's not content to play a minor role in your life, but rather as the story of Cain tells us, sin wants to rule over you. And Jesus warned us of that. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Paul agreed with him, and he wrote these words in the book of Romans. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So we all struggle with sin because we are sinners, and also we struggle with it because of the temptation is so prevalent in our lives and in our world today. And that's why Jesus taught us, as he was teaching us to pray, to pray and lead us not into temptation. So let's pray that prayer together this morning, the whole prayer, as we begin with those words, Our Father. Let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Father, may we feel your presence this morning as your Holy Spirit comes as our leader, our guide, leading us into all truth and glorifying Christ in the process. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And lead us not into temptation. Is it possible that we can never be tempted? That God can take us to a place where temptation never again becomes an issue for us? Well, the truth is that no one is above or beyond temptation. 
Robert, Robert Robinson was describing all of us when he wrote those words in his hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Paul writing to believers in Corinth, to believers who might think that somehow they were above sin or above temptation, wrote these words, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. He's writing to believers. He's reminding us that though we're saved from the penalty of sin and also even from the power of sin, we're not above being tempted. It's still an issue for all of us. Even our Lord Jesus was tempted which is helpful to know this because being tempted is not a sin. It's what we do with temptation that becomes the issue. But Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in, his, uh, in the wilderness after his baptism, but that wasn't the only time he was tempted. Luke tells us that after Satan unsuccessfully sought to j cause Jesus to cave into temptation there in the wilderness, that he left him into an opportune time. And we see evidences of that in uh, chapter 6 of John's Gospel, where after Jesus had fed the 5,000, the crowd wanted to force him to become their king. That's not why he had come, to be an earthly king. That was a temptation to avoid the cross, just as much as Satan was tempting him to avoid the cross in the wilderness temptations. On the night before he was crucified, once again, Satan comes with a temptation so that Jesus would pray that there in the garden, O oh, oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Thankfully, that's not where he stopped. He continued to pray, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was tempted. So therefore, how do you and I think that we're going to be uh, beyond temptation or above temptation? No, we're, we're all subject to being tempted but, but again, if you think that this prayer is somehow praying that God would not allow us to be tempted, let me remind you that while temptation cannot be avoided, it can be resisted. Martin Luther said this about temptation. I can't, call, I can't keep the birds from flying over my head, but I can keep them from making a nest in my hair. It's just a reminder that every time we're tempted, we don't have to give in to temptation. We, we can't avoid it. We're going to be tempted, but what we do with it, we have a choice about. Jesus, I mean, God's word tells us that God provides a way of deliverance. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in chapter 10 or 1 Corinthians, said, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to to bear it. God will provide you a way to escape temptation. But there's a caveat to that, isn't there? First, first off, you've got to want to escape. Now, let's be honest. There are times when we know there's a way to escape. We don't want to escape the temptation. The other is we've got to take it when we have it. Remember the story of Joseph in the book of, Je of uh, Genesis? Joseph, the favorite son of his father Jacob, is sold into slavery by his brothers who hated him. He then becomes a slave to Potiphar and Potiphar's house there in Egypt. But God is with Jacob, with Joseph, and Joseph prospers everything he touches so that Potiphar begins to notice, notice him. And he gives him more and more responsibilities. And finally, he becomes the head steward over Potiphar's house. But Potiphar is not the only one that notices uh, Joseph. Uh, Potiphar's wife notices Joseph. She finds him attractive. She goes after him. She go, goes to seduce him. He continues to resist her until one day she grabs him. And she's not going to let him go until he su submits to her, uh, to her seducing and he says, I, I can't do this. I can't sin against God nor against your husband. I'm not going to do this. And he did the only thing he could do. He ran. He had a choice. He made the right choice. He ran. God provides us with opportunities where we can resist temptation, but we've got to want to resist temptation. There's another misconception here about this petition that somehow what we're saying is, God, sometimes you lead us into temptation. Please don't do that. But you need to hear what God's Word said because His Word is clear that God doesn't tempt us, but He does allow us to be tested. 
James deals with this very subject. In chapter 1, he writes, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. The problem is, is that the word that we have translated tempt, temptation can also be translated as to be tested. So that the word does mean to be tempted, to be seduced to evil, but it also has the connotation of being tested. The context makes the difference about how we're going to interpret the word. A test is a trying circumstance or a difficult situation. Many times that God allows or that sometimes God even orchestrates for his purposes as he seeks to work in our lives. But a temptation is an invitation to sin. It's an encouragement to engage in those activities that we know are contrary to God, to his word, and to his will for our lives. God does test us. Or, or allows us to be tested, but every time it's in order to prove us or to strengthen us. God wants to prove the, real, the, the, the legitimacy of our faith. He wants to grow us in our faith. He wants to strengthen us in our faith. He wants to refine us in our faith. God allows those temptations to take place. God was testing Abraham in Genesis chapter 2. You might remember that God tested him by saying, take your son, Isaac, your only son, take him to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there to me. And there are folks that are saying, how on earth could God do that? Why would God do that? God was simply testing him. God was never going to allow him to, to kill his son, but God was testing him. Do, do you love me more than you love your son? Do you trust that I'm still going to be able to fulfill my promises to make you a father of a great nation? If I take the life of your son, do you trust me? And Abraham passed the test. Satan, however, tempts us in order to seduce us to fall or, or to fail. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he was with his disciples. He looked at Peter and he said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Satan was tempting. He'd asked permission to, to tempt Peter, and Peter failed the test. Wasn't there a way of, yeah, there was a way of escape. He, he had every opportunity to stand up and to do the right thing, but for some reason he chose not to take the way of escape, and he failed miserably. You see, in every situation, in every decision we make in, throughout life, there's always the temptation to do the wrong thing. But there's also the opportunity to do the right thing. We have that in every, every decision that we make. As James wrote, us, wrote to us, each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full, full grown, brings forth death. There are some folks that are saying, you know, I had no choice. God just made me this way, and that's why I sinned, and that's a lie. Well, just, I mean, I'm just human after all. Well, Jesus was human. Jesus was truly human. He is the, he is the picture of what true humanity looks like. You and I are a perversion of true humanity. Sin has corrupted us. So, so you can't blame God. Well, Satan made me do it. The devil made me do it. Thank you, Flip Wilson. But that's a lie also. You and I make choices. And, and the temptations come within. James is real clear here. We're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Satan cannot make you do anything that you don't already want to do. That's the problem. And so God doesn't tempt us. He does allow us to be tested. Satan does tempt us. He wants us to fall and to fail. So here's God on one time in one situation where we're being tested by God so he can prove us or we're tempted by Satan so he can cause us to fail. Good illustration of that. Best biblical illustrations found in the book of Job. As Satan comes into the to where God, the sons of God have gathered in the time of counsel. God says to Satan, where have you been? He says, I've been out among men. God says, surely you've seen my good servant Job. And he says, isn't he faithful? 
And Satan says, well, yeah. I mean, you make life easy for him. He'd be foolish not to be faithful. But boy, you let things get a little difficult. And God allowed a time of testing in Job's life. Satan was seeking to cause Job to quit on God, to curse God, to, to refuse to give God the devotion that God so richly deserved. So here it is in one situation. He's being tempted. He's being, he's being tested. And he passes the test. Listen to his words. When his wife says to him after Satan has attacked him, taken away his family, taken away all of his, all of his possessions, even begin to impact his life. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As Satan turned up the heat on, on, on him in chapter 2 of Job, so Job's wife again says, curse God. And he turns to her and says, shall we accept good things from God and not evil? He passes the test. So when you and I are praying, let, and lead us not into temptation, what are we praying? Well, number one, we're praying, Lord, without you, I will fail. See, contrary to the popular opinion, we all are sinners. And again, contrary to popular opinion, and we cannot manage temptation by ourselves. And as we've already been seeing through the, the, the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, the model prayer, whatever you call it, we've been seeing how dependent we are, that we have limitations. This prayer continually strikes at our pride. It is a blow to our pride. We are reminded, Lord, without you, we don't have the resources we need to live. We don't have food on our table, all the other necessities of life. We don't have them apart from you. We, we are reminded that without, without the Lord, we have no forgiveness for our sins. There's no grace to cover our sins. We are reminded that without the Lord, we have no grace with which we might forgive others. And now we're reminded that apart from God, we have no recourse but to give in to temptation and to sin. And we're humbled because we're confronted with our proneness to wonder, with our propensity to sin and our sinfulness, by our inability to handle the temptations and to resist sin on our own. And so we're forced to admit that by ourselves, we're no match for Satan, we're no match for temptation, we're no match for sin. And we have no power, we have no prayer unless God helps us. When we realize this and we pray with meaning and purpose, we realize that we can make no headway in holiness unless God provides for us. One day, God's kingdom will be fully revealed. One day, we will escape even the presence of sin. Until that time comes, though, we must lean on him day by day. And moment by moment through the days, we have to lean on him and, and on the power that he provides. There's an old hymn we used to sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights, things that are higher, things that are nobler. These have allured my sight. And I want you to know those words are foolishness apart from the, apart from the chorus. It's in the chorus when they sing, I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. It only is you and I hasten to God himself that we find the resources and the power necessary that we can make that resolve no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Jesus does not teach us to pray, Lord, give us the willpower to fight against sin. He teaches us, Lord, come be our shepherd. Come be our guide. Come deliver us. There are words that express dependence, and there's not a hint of self-sufficiency in them. Lord, without you, I will fail. When we pray, that, Lord, uh, lead us not in temptation, we're praying, Lord, I I'm going to cooperate with you as you lead me. It it's really foolish to, to pray this prayer for God's provisions and strength, at the same time, asking for his assistance, at the same time that we're going to be flirting with all the enticements to sin. 
Makes no sense whatsoever. We need to understand that we're always going to be tempted, that the attacks are always going to come from many different places and many different pla uh, t uh, people, many different times, different situations. But Jesus' words must be taken seriously. When he said to his disciples in the garden on the night before his crucifixion, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In his book, Finishing Strong, Stephen Farrar talked about, a, about the, the, the similarities, the commonalities uh, among pastors, spiritual leaders who fail morally. One of the things that they all had in common was that they had no friends or no group that they had that it held them accountable. The other thing is they, they neglected their time in God's word, in prayer, and in worship. I'm not talking about their private time. They didn't uh, uh, neglect Sunday worship. It was their daily time alone with God. The third thing that these guys were doing, they were spending a significant amount of time with women other than their wives. And then finally, the one thing that they all held in common was this one thing. Every one of them said, that'll never happen to me. That'll never happen to me. You see, you and I need to cooperate with God, first of all, by acknowledging we're vulnerable. It's interesting. At the very point we think that we're least vulnerable, we're probably the most vulnerable. There's a retired pastor from the Northeast whose significant works uh, have influenced my life, reading him. I'm reading a book that he wrote recently. I heard him uh, recently uh, in a seminar that he did back in 2005. And, and he talks about the fact that uh, he kept thinking that his relationship with his wife was so strong, he loved her so much, that, that if, if Satan was going to attack him in any place, it wasn't going to be in terms of his relationships. Guess where Satan attacked him? And guess where he failed? Right there in terms of violating the covenant agreement that he had with his wife. Because he didn't think that Satan could get him there. And that's many times what happens. We need to understand we all are vulnerable. Satan doesn't always attack us at our weaknesses. Sometimes he attacks us at our very point of strength. We think that we're strong. We need to understand God has given us his word and he intends for us to utilize his word in our life and to spend time with him. We, we need to understand that there are certain situations we need not be in. There are books we should not be reading. There is music we should not be listening to. There are movies and TV shows we should not be watching that are not going to help us if we're going to live a life of holiness. And so it doesn't do any good to pray this prayer if you're going to put, submit yourself in those kind of situations. God's Word says, here's how you cooperate with Him. James says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But you and I cannot resist the devil until we first submit to God. It, it begins right there. That's where we begin our times of consciously cooperating with God. We come and lay all that we are at the throne of God and say, I'm yours, take me. All that I am, it begins right there. It doesn't mean that you won't continue to struggle. Many times, now the, tempt, now the battle's going to get even stronger. But it's where you've got to make the first step. I, I submit to you. You need to take time to spend time with God in His Word, that daily quiet time. Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You want to see a good example of that? The supreme example of that? Go back to the temptations of Christ. There in the wilderness, as each time Satan comes to him with a temptation, he responds with a word from God. This is what God's word says. It is written. It is written. Hide that word within your heart. There's some other things you need to do. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, But you, O man of God, flee these things, talking about the desire to get rich and the love of money. But he doesn't say just flee these things. He says to him, And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. In 2 Timothy, he writes to his young friend, Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the Lord from a, pure, from a pure heart. You see, it's not enough just simply to avoid 
the bad things. There's the good things that we need to start pursuing, the things of God that need to be a part of our lives. Finally, when we're praying, and lead us not into temptation, we're praying, Lord, I will trust you to lead me to victory. That's what Jesus was doing that night in the garden when he prayed, Lord, if it's possible that this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. And in that, he's saying to, to his heavenly father, you have the resources I need so that I might be victorious over this temptation. And so it is with you and me. We pray, Lord, spare us from this moral test. But if, we must, if it must come, then give us the strength to be victorious. Here's the good news. God wants you to be victorious. God wants to provide those resources to you. But he also wants to lead you in his paths of righteousness for his namesake. He calls us to put off the evil and to put on Christ. He calls us to repent and to embrace the new life. He calls us to be filled with His Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit so that we might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God has the resources for us. We've got to trust Him. Now, no person is ever going to fully escape the seduction from sin. We're going to be tempted and there's going to be moments when we're going to cave into sin and we're going to give into sin. And when we do, the good news is there's still hope. For God has made a wonderful provision for us in Christ Jesus that he will forgive. John in his first epistle writes, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, if you are here without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, realize it's sin that's separating you from God. But Jesus Christ died on the cross to deal with that sin problem and to make reconciliation with God possible. As you open your heart to him and ask him to come into your life, willing to repent of sin, and to turn completely to him in faith, he'll forgive you. Forgiveness is available. As a Christ follower, we still struggle. We still give in. But if we'll confess, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's power is available to lead us through temptation. And he makes a wonderful promise for those of us that will take him up on the power he offers. Where, he write, where James writes, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, we will be tempted to sin, but God's power is available to overcome and so Jesus taught us to pray and lead us not into temptation. Would you pray with me? Father, we find ourselves struggling. We know the right that we want to do, and yet because of a sinful nature that still wars within us, we find ourselves giving in and doing the very things that we don't want to do. But we're thankful, Father, that through Jesus Christ there's victory. Victory first over the penalty of sin, but also now the power of sin, so that, Lord, through Christ Jesus we can say no. Our problem is, Lord, that we don't take advantage of the way of escape that you provided. And sometimes, Lord, to be honest, we don't, we don't want to. And that's why we need to continually pray that you would change our hearts. And give us a heart that desires to be yours and yours alone. Thank you, Father, for the power that you provide. Through the cross of Jesus, through the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit, through your word hidden in our heart, through a new heart that desires to do your bidding. Thank you, Father, that you're available to lead us to victory. And thank you, Father, that when we fail... You're there to pick us up and help us to start all over again. I pray, Lord, for that one that is yet to give their heart to Christ, that they would understand the, 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 what sin is doing in their lives 
and how, Father, it is destroying them, and, Father, how desperately they need a Savior. I pray, Lord, today that you'll draw them to the Savior and give them that new life. And for those of us that know Christ Jesus, may we determine in our hearts through your power, through your grace, through your strength, that we're going to live for you, for your glory, and for your honor. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if there's some decision you need to make about your relationship with God, I'll be in the fellowship hall afterwards. If you're online, you can uh, you write to us. Either you can go online and uh, find our website, find ways to contact us there, or uh, there it's uh, our email address is office at seminalfirstbaptist.com. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you. Pastor Mike referenced this hymn and his message. We're going to close with it, with, it, with it this morning. Stand together as we sing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me. Thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I'll let you go and be seated for just a minute. Daniel's going to dismiss us. This is his first time back in two weeks, so he has a lot to say this morning. Hello, everybody. Have a good morning. No. Uh, hey, good morning, church. We are so glad to see you this morning. Uh, we are glad that you're here with us. I'm um, here at Seminole First Baptist Church, and just thank you so much for coming out. And thank you for uh, wearing your face mask this morning and just uh, for, for just being mindful uh, of others and loving others through doing that um, throughout today, uh, today's service. I do want to highlight uh, just one thing, and if you did pick up a bulletin, you're going to find that we just have one insert in there, and that is uh, next Sunday we're going to be doing uh, the Blood Mobile is going to be here. And so if you'd like to give blood, it's going to be here from 9 to 1 o'clock. And they're asking everybody who's interested in giving blood to sign up. And you can find uh, the sign-up information uh, by appointment on that flyer. You can grab one of those on your way out today. And uh, with that, also, you can also uh, sign up. Uh, you can call the church and let Lori know uh, that you'd like to give blood as well. That would work as well. Um, on your way out today, you're going to notice those buckets in the back. If you came, came today with uh, the heart and the plan to give financially, to give your tithe, uh, we just encourage you to place uh, your gift uh, there in the bucket. And, uh, and then also, I mean, I haven't been here in a few weeks. I, I guess we're going to dismiss like we used to at least three weeks ago. You know, So we're going to dismiss here in a moment. But uh, Pastor Mike is going to be out in the fellowship hall, as he said, and if you'd like to chat with him, uh, he'd be happy to do so. Let, so let's go ahead and uh, close out in a word of prayer, and then I will dismiss you. God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. God, we thank you for your kindness and your love to us. 
We thank you, Lord, for this morning as we uh, come together here in this building, Lord. We know this building is not the church, but we are the church, Lord. And so as we leave this place now, I pray that you would just help us as your church to just be salt and light in this community, Lord. That we would uh, we show people the love of Christ in our actions and in our words. And that, Lord, uh, we would be drawing close to your word daily and that you would keep us from temptation, Lord. Thank you now for this day. And I pray this all in your great and holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right, if you were on the right or left side, you guys can feel free to head on out.